This is Argopectin irradiance. It's not a monster, it's a base scallop. Base scallops, like all shellfish, are filter feeders. They pump water through their bodies, grazing on microscopic plants, phytoplankton, that are naturally occurring in the environment. In doing so, this provides a tremendous ecosystem service by increasing the amount of dissolved oxygen available to all living things in the ocean. Phytoplankton aren't bad in and of themselves. In fact, they're the foundation of the food web in the ocean. But in abundance, they can lead to low oxygen levels. How this happens is when the sun comes up, phytoplankton photosynthesize, they respirate. And then when the sun goes down, they can't, pho they can't photosynthesize, so they only respirate. And this can lead to low oxygen levels after a long, hot day. When the sun goes down after a long, hot day, all that phytoplankton respirating right before the sun comes up is when the dissolved oxygen can get critically low, leading to anoxic or hypoxic situations where there's not enough oxygen available in the water. Shellfish and other filter feeders reduce that occurrence from happening by the mechanism in which they feed. They take the phytoplankton out of the water, use it for growth, reproduction, energy, and increase the dissolved oxygen. They also increase light penetration to the sea floor. Because they're taking particulate matter out of the water, it's increasing how much sunlight reaches the sea floor, promoting aquatic vegetation, like eelgrass, which is essential fish habitat, very important to our commercial fisheries. Another ecosystem service that shellfish provide is they absorb carbon. The oceans absorb carbon from our atmosphere, and shellfish mineralize or crystallize that carbon in the form of calcium carbonate to create their shells, putting it in long-term carbon storage. Take a closer look, 150 times magnified, of uh, blue mussel, Middleus edulis. Water's pumping through the blue mussel, and it's being retained on what's commonly termed the gills. These are not gills, though. It's more like a screen mesh. It's called tinidia. And this tinidia has hair-like structures that are catching the food particles and handing the food particles off like a football to a food groove that's in the lower part of the screen. You can see it right there. This next slide shows a similar action happening in the beloved eastern oyster, or American oyster, Chrysostria virginica. The tinidia on either side of the food groove uh, brought the food, the phytoplankton, to the food groove. And the food groove there, you can see, moving horizontally, bring the food to the mouth of the shellfish, in this case, an oyster. Quick biology lesson. Oysters, like most things in nature, react to a temperature spawning cue. When the water temperature warms up to around 68 degrees, the oysters put their male and female gametes, their egg and sperm, in the water. Fertilization happens when those male and female gametes randomly collide with each other, creating a fertilized larvae. The chance of that happening is very slim, so the oysters spawn millions. A female oyster puts 8 million eggs in the water. A male oyster puts enough milk in the water to fertilize that of seven female oysters. Think about that when you're swimming in July, but that's what's happening. So if that random chance does happen, you have the simple single-celled soft-bodied larvae. After just a day, it's this really involved trochophore larvae. It's got hair-like structures, cilia really, that allow it to be mobile. Oysters are different than hard-shell clams, soft-shell clams, razor clams. Those other shellfish have to burrow in the sediment to protect themselves from predators in order to undergo metamorphosis. Oysters need to attach onto a substrate to keep, them, keep themselves above the sediment so they don't get buried by the, uh, by, by the sediment and suffocate. So an oyster, if it survives for two or three weeks, if it doesn't get eaten by a little shrimp or a minnow, if oyster larvae survives through that two or three week uh, phase of uh, larvae phase, if it lands on a hard substrate like a shell or a rock, it will crystallize calcium carbonate that's naturally occurring in the water and stay there for the rest of its life until it's preyed upon, dies of a disease, or harvested. But I'm a farmer. I don't want to pluck oysters off rocks. Just like any farmer wants to start with their seed in the spring, I want to start with my seed in the spring. So this is a pilot scale hatchery. We got our seed from a hatchery, and this is a pilot scale hatchery we started with University of Rhode Island a few years ago. We put our broodstock oysters in that blue tank, a couple hundred broodstock oysters, the parent stock oysters, the oysters we want to be the parents of our baby oysters. We choose the best looking oysters, the fastest growing oysters, maybe some oysters that survived a disease event, and we put them in that tank and we gradually raise the temperature of the water up. In December, we're mimicking the temperatures of the spring. By the time the spring rolls around, we're mimicking the temperatures of summer. Now they're putting their massive numbers of male and female gametes in the water in this controlled setting. Remember how many each, each oyster is putting in the water. Now this is happening in controlled setting, resulting in literally billions of fertilized larvae. At this point is the only point that humans are feeding the oysters is in this larval stage. We have to grow 
a monoculture of the right species of algaes and drip it into that tank with the larvae. There's red algaes, green algaes, brown algaes. Different types of algaes have different amounts of fats, carbohydrates, proteins. So the lab manager has to you know, figure out what the, uh, what the larvae needs by checking it out under a microscope, checking out its health, and adjusting its diet. And if we can get that larvae to survive for between two and three weeks, the oyster becomes what's called sticky. It wants to start sticking onto a hard substrate. I don't want to sell an oyster attached onto a rock or a shell. I just want to sell an individual animal. So in the hatchery, we crush up clam shell, fine like sand, and present it to the oyster larvae. The oyster larvae lands in that crushed up shell, thinking it's attaching onto a rock or a big piece of shell, or not thinking anything because it's just an oyster larvae, and that's how we get oyster seed. There's a few hundred of them in my hand. One million of these oyster seed at about one millimeter fits in about the volume of a grapefruit. So we take our one million oysters and we bring them out to our oyster farm. This is the Matunic Oyster Farm in Southern Rhode Island. We put them in these sturdy plastic mesh bags. And as they get bigger, they graduate into larger size mesh bags. And eventually, they'll be poured into these trays with an open cover to uh, allow the water to easily move over the oysters. What determines an oyster's growth is something called cestin flux, milligrams of food times liters per minute. How much food is in the water, how much phytoplankton is in the water, and how fast that water is moving. So the water gets restricted somewhat from this gear. Um, so there's the, the open uh, tray allows water to move easily over it. So we can't put the small ones in there, otherwise they'll be preyed upon. So as they get bigger, we um, move them into the trays when they become predator proof. So there's 10 to 15 million animals out here at any time. 10 to 15 million filters filtering the water, increasing the amount of dissolved oxygen, increasing the amount of light penetration to the seafloor, increasing the amount of aquatic vegetation, increasing the biodiversity. 10 to 15 million filters acting as carbon sinks. The only problem with shellfish aquaculture is that not everybody wants to see it in their backyard. Shellfish aquaculture is this most sustainable form of animal protein production that I know of. I took this picture on the last commercial fishing trip I ever went on about 20 years ago. Pulled this net about the size of a football field through the Atlantic Ocean. Captain pulled it up on board. I uh, was the one to climb on top of the pile of fish, in this case it was squid, and tie the bridle around the top of the net. The captain would suspend the net as you see it there, and one of the other deckhands would trip the cod end of the net, allowing this awesome amount of fish to spill at our feet. Me and the other deckhands, we picked the fish that we didn't have a market for, or the uh, fish we weren't allowed to keep out overboard, and we put our target species down below in the fish pens. We put the crushed ice over the fish and we'd squish the ice through the squid with our boots, unforgettable feeling. Uh, there's a lot better ways of doing that now, uh, a lot better ways of fishing. Uh, fishermen and women have improved uh, their techniques over time. Year after year, more people have gone fishing and caught more fish. The Industrial Revolution went from steam-powered engines to combustion-powered engines. We got more powerful boats. World War II, we developed sonar, radar. We started using that technology to capture fish, GPS. We got really efficient at capturing fish. We caught more and more fish year after year until around the 80s. You can see here in the uh, dark blue and light blue, our commercial fisheries have really plateaued out. About 25% more people are going fishing than we did in the 80s. We're catching about the same amount of fish. We can continue to catch fish and eat fish sustainably, in my opinion, but we can't continue to increase how much we're catching year after year. The demand on seafood is not plateauing out though. The demand on seafood only continues to increase with a growing population, with increasing wealth, and with education. People know that seafood is a great protein option. They're eating more of it. So the only way we can fill this widening gap between the supply from our captured fisheries and the demand is aquaculture, growing aquatic organisms. And globally, we are. Aquaculture is the fastest growing food producing industry in the world. It's growing the fastest in Africa with a population is happening the fastest. It exists the most in Asia. China makes about 60% of the world's total production of aquatically grown organisms. The United States, just 0.6%. If we want to eat sustainable seafood here in the United States in the future, we need a real increase in sustainable aquaculture in the United States, along with a well-managed commercial fishery. The United Nations came up with 17 goals for sustainable development to provide a shared blueprint for peace, prosperity, for people and the planet now and into the future. Aquaculture fits 14 of these goals. We can continue 
to use our oceans for transportation, recreation, tourism, and farming. We need to find a balance. If we are to have sustainable seafood here in the United States, we need to accept sustainable aquaculture here in the United States. This is not a monster. This is sustainable seafood. Thank you.